There's been a lot of talk about new teams coming into Formula One over the last few years, and now there's that big argument between the commercial rights holders and the governing body. One side wants more teams, fewer races, and the other just wants more races with the same amount of teams. And it's, like I say, causing a huge argument. The reason I say this is because in the so-called good old days, there were so many teams on the grid, there were teams that wouldn't make the start of the race due to being so slow. It was still the time of the have-a-go heroes with very little money and a can-do attitude, or just people utterly deluded that they could make it into the big time of Formula 1 by spending a grand total of less than a sausage roll from Greg's, which at last check is £1.20. I mean, this country really is finished. It meant that there was a group of perennial backmarkers that didn't have much to show for themselves. They'd arrive quietly and disappear just as quietly. Most people wouldn't even know that they were there. And most of them came from Italy as well, as it seemed like a bunch of people saw to be the next Ferrari, but only ended up being the next... Well, insert utterly rubbish Italian sports car manufacturer here. But some of these have-a-go heroes had some experience elsewhere that should have helped them in the big bad world of Formula 1. One of those teams was Eurobrun. So, it's the 1987 season and there are two drivers down on luck at the moment. The first is a man called Stefano Moderna, who was about to win the Formula 3000 championship, which is now Formula 2 and GP2 before that. And the other guy was called Oscar Larauri, I think that's how it's pronounced, an Argentine racer. Argentinian? Argentine? Which one is it? I can never tell. Larari had been the winner of the European Formula 3 championship back in 1982, and at that point he'd been driving for the Euro racing team. Following this, he went to sports cars and was running in a Porsche Group C machine prepped by Walter Brunn, but there was one more problem on top of this. The guy was 33. If he wanted to get into Formula 1, he had to do it soon. And this is where an interjection has to be made, because Damon Hill was around 31-32 when he got his start with Brabham during the 1992 Formula 1 season. Obviously, he went on to Williams and was then champion by 1996. But the thing is, this Larari guy doesn't have that name attached to him. He's not the son of Graham Hill. He's not the son of a, well, he's not the son of Carlos Reutemann or Juan Manuel Fangio. Hold that thought for a second. So it's a case of every year that goes by, his chances of making it to Formula One just drop off more and more and more and more until it's borderline non-existent. Because who's going to take a 33-year-old rookie that virtually nobody's heard of? Something that worked in Larari's favour is where we bring back that thought, and he was hotly rated by Juan Manuel Fangio, who was then the most successful driver in Formula 1 history with his five world championships. While the likes of Clark and Stewart had attained more wins in their careers, Fangio was still the greatest of all time in those days, and having the seal of approval from him must have been like a free ticket anywhere. So Euro Racing and Brun's endurance team decided to team up. Brun had made his fortune selling slot machines and Euro Racing had single seat experience that Brun didn't. So with one side providing the financial knowledge and backing and the other providing what expertise it had, then it should have been a good partnership. And Euro Racing actually had some Formula 1 experience because they built the chassis for Alfa Romeo in the early 80s when Alfa decided to have Auto Delta make the engines and then outsource the chassis construction elsewhere. And Euro Racing had done this between 1983 and Alfa's withdrawal in 1985. The team would be ready in time for the 1988 season, the transition year of the Formula 1 regulations. While it was the last year of turbos being allowed in the sport, a lot of the teams had made the switch from turbos to naturally aspirated engines, so they could get a head start on development. Those that stayed with turbos did so at their own risk, and if you're McLaren and Honda, that gamble paid off, because Honda went for one last roll of the dice to produce one of the most dominant seasons in history. Eurobrun had turned up in a car that was a pretty common sight in those days. Steep nose, low engine cover, cheap and cheerful Ford in the back, and it wasn't a car that was going to turn heads or be as good as the McLarens or other front-running cars. The car was painted white due to sponsorship from a conveyor belt company, as in those days the teams took whatever they could get. Well, the back of the grid teams took whatever they could get, and Larari was given one of the seats due to his connections with Brun's sports car team and the Euro racing team before that. In the other car was Stefano Modena, Formula 3000 champion, so that should have at least brought some column inches to the team. He'd also done a one-off drive with Brabham the previous year. The thinking was, in those days, if you got like the up-and-comer in one of the back-of-the-grid teams, then what would happen is if you got a fluke result where he scored points or otherwise impressed, one of the bigger teams would come in for him, and that meant more cash for the team, in this case, Eurobrun. And there's that little bit of publicity there as well, the F3000 champions driving for this team, so... There's, I think you can see where I'm going with all of this. I, I've, I've turned into um, Anthony Kiedis from the Chili Peppers. 
Because in those days, Formula One was a tad different. A team could enter the sport and fluke their way to one or two decent results, or some up-and-comer or otherwise unknown driver could end up putting in a performance that makes some of the mid-grid teams like Ligier, Arrows and so on go, we need that guy, and they can afford him while the team that the driver is currently at probably can't. Now I should add that fluking isn't a term that should be applied to all of these teams because guys like March, Leighton House and Jordan both achieved incredibly with minimal budgets. With Euro Brun in 1988, Real and Dallara also entered the sport. You've also got the Colony team embarking on their first full season after entering late in 1987. So with now 31 cars on the grid, the FIA had to bring in pre-qualifying to weed out some of these cars before they went into the actual proper qualifying session. Now I've explained this rule a few times now, but since it's been so long since I talked about one of these kinds of teams, I'll just give everybody a crash course or a refresher. The FIA at some point in the 15 to 20 years prior to this story taking place had decided that the absolute maximum amount of cars that could start a Grand Prix would be 26. There was a time when Monaco was the only race on the calendar that would have fewer slots due to capacity and safety. Which seems like a bit of a moment of hypocrisy when the reaction to a death in those days was, oh no! Anyway, so what would happen is that everybody went into a massive qualifying session and the fastest 26 would qualify, assuming there were 26 cars. The previous year at the first race of the season there'd been 23 starters, so you were guaranteed to be on the grid irrespective of how slow you were. Ivan Capelli was 17 seconds off Mansell's pole time at the 1997 Brazilian Grand Prix. But now there were too many cars to fit at most races so you had to eliminate some of them before you could eliminate some of them if that makes any sense. So what would happen now is the four new teams and the five new drivers would go into a shootout. Now you're probably thinking, hang on Aiden, we know you're bad at maths, but come on, four teams, two drivers, that's eight. Ah, but here's the thing, in those days, one driver teams were still allowed. So in this case, De Cesaris in the Real, the two Eurobruns of Modena and Larari, Tarquini in the Coloni, and Alex Caffey in the Dallara. They all went into their own little private session with just the five of them. The fastest four would be mixed with the remaining 26, and the slowest would be going home before the actual qualifying session had begun. Both Larauri and Modena were able to get through the session relatively easily, but then reliability and general slowness of the car would get in the way. Both cars retired in Brazil before Larauri couldn't qualify at Imola, while Modena was not classified due to being too many laps down. Eight laps down, in fact. Modena would then be excluded before the races even started in Monaco and Mexico as he missed a weight check at the former and then his rear wing was too high at the latter. But the fact remained that up until the Hungarian Grand Prix, at least one car qualified, even if they weren't finishing particularly high. If they did finish in a position that today would get them on the verge of points, it's the old reliability RNG that got them there. Has to be said though that Modena's average qualifying position was around 20th, so it's not like they were propping up the field. Well, I mean, Larari was usually 24th or 26th, but Modena was doing quite well with the machinery he had. Between Belgium and Portugal, neither car would qualify. Larari went on a run of six non-qualifications, and it was a case of just not qualifying until the final two rounds. Well, the final round, I should say, because that was when both of them retired. For Larari, that was the last time he made a race start. Behind the scenes though, things weren't fun. Modena was crushing Larari and it was Larari that had helped bring the two teams together. Larari had also collided with Rene Arnoux at Canada and had garnered a reputation for being a mobile chicane that was just getting in everybody's way. The Euro racing side was getting less interested in Formula 1, while Bruin wanted to replace Larari, stick him back in the sports cars and replace him with someone faster like Christian Dana. But Dana didn't fit in the car. Money was really the big issue, the other teams around them were able to improve and Eurobrun couldn't improve, so they basically just got overtaken and they slipped down, so they just weren't qualifying. While the first half of the season had been okay, the second half was woeful. Both sides could see the issues that were developing. Brun even tried to buy out Lotus or Brabham with a consortium of other people, including Peter Windsor, but nothing came of the takeover talks. So he carried on running the team by himself as the Euro racing higher-ups pulled out. Some did stick around though, like designer Brun and the 1988 car was evolved into something else for 1989, and they also entered just the one car to save money. Ferrari had indeed gone back to sports cars while Modena went to Brabham, so replacing them was Gregor Foytek. Foytek was a name that brought a lot of chatter to the paddock, not because he was some hotshot driver that had the potential to race with the likes of Senna and co, but because he was still carrying around the blame of causing the crash at Brands Hatch that almost cost Johnny Herbert his legs. 
He'd also been involved in a couple of questionable incidents involving Eric Bernard and Roberto Moreno, but the Brands incident helps perpetuate this belief that the guy was an utter maniac on track. Now I'm not judging him as such, I'm just saying why people think that he was. Someone said on the Autosport forums back in 2010 that it takes a special kind of somebody to out Guillard Olivier Guillard, which is a fantastic line, but I don't know much about Foytex, so I'm just, you know, just saying what I've seen. I'm sure somebody has and can probably, you know, give a, a more representative description. But anyway, this was now 1989 and Eurobrun had a B-spec car of something that wasn't that good anyway in the second half of the previous season, and only had one driver to get them through. They did manage to get some sponsorship, but it didn't look to be enough. The other problem was that in 1989, the entry list had opened up to a record setting, 39 cars. Don't get excited, that's never happening again. So Eurobrun was going to have a harder time getting through into the proper qualifying sessions. 13 cars entered pre-qualifying for the 1989 Brazilian Grand Prix, and Foytek did make it into the top 30, only to qualify 29th of the 30 six and a half seconds slower than Senna's McLaren. It also has to be mentioned that at this point that the 29th place Foytek got there at Jacaparagua was the only time he entered the top 30. For the rest of 1989, it's a sea of pink. Did not pre-qualify across the board, which might be a record. I say this because the likes of Life didn't make it to the final round of the season, and Andrea Moda made the grid at least once as well. Unless there's the Coloni team, because they're often labelled as the DMPQ Kings. They actually share the record, Coloni did that in 1991 while Eurobrun did it in 1989. It's 15 DMPQs each for reference, but that's one that will only satisfy those who are really into their stats. I don't really look too much into it, I just try to find stuff that's interesting to tell you. Foytek quit the team after the Belgian Grand Prix and Larauri was drafted back in, doing double duty with the sports car stuff in Brun's Group C operation. During this time, the team had been fiddling with a new car, the ER189, that had got Jägermeister sponsorship on board, so it was painted in a bright orange colour scheme to reflect that. But money was so tight that they only had one of these, and if it was crashed or otherwise broke down, they had to use the old car as the spare. Larauri picked up where Foytek left off, not pre-qualifying for another race that season. Jägermeister had also naffed off, leaving the car a black sponsorless mess for the final round at Adelaide, and this prompted other teams to question whether or not they should even be allowed into 1990, because they were clearly not competitive and taking up a spot that could have been offered to someone who would actually try to compete. But despite the money trouble, Brun took the bold step of going back to a two-car outfit for 1990. Enter two new drivers. One was an Italian pay driver called Claudio Langes, hope I've got that pronunciation correct, and the other is the Brazilian journeyman Roberto Moreno. And here come the giddy Moreno meme comments. They managed to get some more sponsorship from JSK that resulted in a silver livery, and Moreno somehow dragged the car out of pre-qualifying at Phoenix and into the top 26 overall, although given Jean Alesi's heroics in that race, it's probably more to do with the Pirelli tyres than anything to do with the driver. It was Eurobrun's first start in 17 attempts, they'd gone through all of 1989 without starting a single Grand Prix. While Moreno was able to make the top 26, it was a bit concerning that Langes couldn't pre-qualify, but at least he was faster than Gary Brabham's live car, so there is that. Moreno, meanwhile, had got to 16th on the grid, ahead of Mansell and also ahead of other back-of-grid rivals like Onyx, Arrows and Dallara, and was in the mix with people like Minardi and Ligier. The only other time Moreno would qualify would be San Marino, but he retired on the first lap with a dodgy throttle. He was then excluded from the standings in Mexico for being pushed started, which is against the rules. Meanwhile, Langes was only being kept around for his cash and was on the edge of being fired after the Canadian Grand Prix, but only stayed because he found more money with which to race. It didn't help matters as he kept on DMPQing while Moreno also never made the grid again. The wiki stats table showing that telltale sea of pink and Langes has a 100% DMPQ record in his Formula 1 career, which is only shared with um, a smattering of other drivers. But Moreno was given a lifeline. What happened was Brun decided that he wasn't going to bother taking the team to the final two flyaway races at Japan and Australia, so both drivers were released from their contracts because there was no team to race for. So, now a free agent, Moreno was free to go wherever he wanted. At the same time, Alessandro Nanini suffered his helicopter crash, and that meant that Moreno could be super sub at Benetton. He went to the Japanese Grand Prix, where he finished second after the incident involving Senna and Prost at Turn 1. The stats show that Eurobrun had entered 76 Grand Prix and failed to qualify for 55 of them. That's a 72.368% failure rate. 
but scored no points and scored a best result of 11th. To have gone a whole 16 rounds without qualifying for a Grand Prix must also be a record, and for the team to be quietly disbanded just before the end of the 1990 season is probably the only thing the team got right in the three seasons it ran. Brun Motorsport as a whole collapsed before the 1992 season, just as Group C was coming to an end, after which Walter Brun got involved with the likes of RWS and Conrad Motorsport. It's mentioned in several places that the collapse of the F1 team had the knock-on effect into the sports car team, as funds dried up everywhere, even with Group C at the end becoming massively financially unviable for a manufacturer, let alone a privateer. It's one of those things that sounded like a good idea at the time, it's also something that could have gone vastly differently if only a small thing changed. Well, maybe. I don't know. You might want to discuss that one down in the comments. A tiny bit more sponsorship, a driver that managed to pull off a fluke result to get more points and therefore more money from Bernie, or a team that's a little bit bigger and a bit more successful comes in for a driver that's performing above and beyond what the car can do. But it's just one of those things. Eurobrun just seems to be another one of those late 80s or early 90s teams that went before they'd even arrived, if that makes any sense. So then, a look at the Eurobrun team from the late 80s. If this has been interesting for you, then do like the video so I know a good job was done, and subscribe as well, because several comments are about to mention that it's 2,500 or so until 100k. Get that bell on too, so you never miss out on one of these videos as well. Massive thanks as ever to the kind folk at Patreon for the continued support. If you want to help contribute to the picture purchasing piggy bank, the links to Patreon are in the description, as well as affiliate links, Discord, and socials. There might still be a winter sale on with the F1 store, so you might be able to get some savings there. Oh, and there's also super thanks and membership buttons for other ways of supporting. So until next time, I've been Ada Maud. Have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye. Mm -hmm.